let's just start by talking a little bit about the basics of COVID-19. This really has been a incredible event in the history of the world during our lifetime. Certainly um, nothing that we've seen has caused the impact on commerce and on world health um, in our lifetimes like COVID-19 has. As I think most people know, the infection occurs primarily through the spread of droplets from when an infected person uh, expels them either through coughing, sneezing, talking, etc., and then inhaled by another. Once in the nose, there are spike proteins on the surface of the virus, and these interact with very specific receptors on the cell surface. ACE2 is probably the most important, although we're discovering other cofactors as well that may participate um, in this process. The virus multiplies. It may travel down the airway to the lungs where it infects other cells via the ACE receptor. And this infection of these cells deep in the lungs causes the pneumonia and causes uh, severe disease. In about 20 to 40% of individuals, the components of the immune system appear to control the infection. And these patients have uh, minimal or few symptoms and may remain uh, completely symptom free. They can still emit some droplets containing active virus, but fewer than if they are, are more dramatically infected. What about risk factors for critical illness? So the majority of uh, patients are going to do well who are infected with COVID, but we know that up to about 5% will develop uh, severe illness. And risk factors for that pathway are increasing age and the, uh, the overlay between mortality rate and increasing age really is quite dramatic in this disease. And also the presence of a number of comorbidities really raise the risk for a, a severe course as well. And these comorbidities include things like cardiovascular disease, such as heart failure, hypertension, chronic lung disease, uh, cancer, and chronic kidney disease, obesity, et cetera. Um, it appears that male sex is a risk factor for uh, worse disease as well, as is blood type A. And as Dr. Araneta discussed, non-white ancestry appears to be a risk factor for a variety of, of quite complicated reasons. So what is our basic approach to treatment? The first is to assure adequate oxygenation within the patient. So a lot of the problems that patients run into when they have a severe COVID infection is really due to the lungs being unable to do their job. We're able to give uh, supplemental oxygen either through nasal prongs or a face mask. If that proves inadequate, then we need to put the patient on a mechanical ventilator, essentially um, administer anesthesia, put a tube down into the windpipe and put them on a breathing machine, sometimes for several weeks. In some patients, uh, that's still inadequate for eliminating carbon dioxide and getting enough oxygen to the patient. And we have to do what's called extracorporeal support. And that's a situation where we put these very large cannulae into the patient and remove uh, blood at a very high rate put it through an artificial lung to put oxygen in, take carbon dioxide out, and then put that oxygen blood, rich blood back into the patient. At the same time, we're assuring adequate oxygenation. We are using medications to try to improve the, the course of the disease. Remdesivir is an antiviral agent. And while there's some arguments about its exact degree of efficacy, uh, we think it is helpful in this situation. Dexamethasone is a corticosteroid which decreases inflammation and appears to improve patient outcomes as well. There's some data to suggest that convalescent plasma, which is plasma that has antibodies against SARS-CoV, may have some utility as well. And then there's a variety of experimental therapies that are underway, uh, of which testing is underway as well. At the same time we're doing that, we do general supportive care, avoidance of complications, and then ultimately rehabilitation as patients improve. This is things like nutrition, like avoiding uh, skin breakdown, all sorts of things that don't sound very interesting, but actually are extremely important and have a major impact on the outcome of the patient. And I am proud to say that the outcomes at UCSD, particularly for patients with severe illness, are really in the, the top tier of hospitals across the nation. So at UCSD, we got a little bit of a head start because back in February, uh, evacuation flights of American citizens from Wuhan, China were routed to a number of places on the West Coast, but that included Miramar Marine Air Corps Station close to our campus. And some of those patients became ill and were taken to UCSD Medical Center. And it, it was really a wake up call that we had to use this precious time to really get organized and prepare ourselves for large numbers of, of incoming patients. As February blended into March, the, the news really became quite grim from Italy, from Iran, from New York, and we saw many hospitals be completely overwhelmed 
uh, by the number of patients that they, they saw. And we were determined at UCSD to not let that happen. So we really started very early planning for a major surge of patients. Our approach involved finding non-intensive care unit spaces that we could accommodate critical care in, that we could put a ventilator in if we needed to, meaning that it had uh, piping for air, oxygen, suction, uh, monitors, things that we needed. And we developed a very detailed plan with nine phases to expand from 25 medical intensive care unit beds to be able to ventilate over 220 COVID-19 patients if we needed to. We also made plans to expand our uh, ICU capable personnel really by blending intensive care unit trained nurses and doctors with non-intensive care unit trained ones to create these mixed teams if necessary capable of caring for critically ill patients. We also uh, made sure we had adequate equipment to care for large numbers of critically ill patients um, so that we wouldn't experience shortages um, if that occurred. So in terms of equipment, um, we went from a capacity of um, running about 20 to 30 ventilators per day, which is what we do on a normal day. Um, in a busy flu season, there might be three to six patients intubated uh, on ventilators because of um, respiratory failure from influenza. And we uh, stockpiled uh, 155 ventilators. Plus, um, we had the ability to ventilate about 55 more in the operating room from anesthesia machines. We requested up to 150 more ventilators from state and federal stockpiles as well. Um, we worked very early to assure adequate supplies of personal protective equipment as well. Um, we were very concerned initially about how much staff attrition we would have, people getting sick from COVID um, among our doctors and nurses. And fortunately, once um, proper protective measures were implemented, we've had very few people become ill. We took an inventory of our other doctors so we could um, stretch our staffing of non-critically ill COVID patients as well. We worked very closely with other hospitals to assure resiliency of other hospitals in the region um, and planned collaboratively. And then finally, we did contingency planning with our biomedical ethics people to ensure that if we started running out of mechanical ventilators or other life-saving equipment, that we would ration them um, on an agreed-to basis um, with similar criteria in all hospitals in, in San Diego County. At the same time this was going on and keeping us busy, um, it was clear that in Tijuana and in Baja, California, that a humanitarian uh, crisis was really unfolding um, as uh, hospitals there were really overwhelmed by, by patients. Um, in Tijuana, our neighbor, most of the COVID patients were at Tijuana General Hospital and the doctors and nurses were very, very motivated, but they were short staffed because many were out with COVID-19 themselves. Um, we decided to send a volunteer team involving doctors, nurses, translators, respiratory therapists, really to show up in person um, and work collaboratively every day, seven days a week for, for four weeks to really build relationships and then uh, proceed to a telemedicine approach. We organized this with the San Diego County Medical Society, but UCSD really provided about 80 to 90 percent of the personnel and the key administrative support. And our focus was really on optimizing intensive care unit care in terms of optimizing the way the mechanical ventilators were used, the way patients were positioned, um, and nursing interventions as well. We also identified some um, equipment deficiencies, which we hope to remedy as well. And based on our experience, we worked with the leadership of the hospital in terms of making detailed suggestions for improvement, and these were really greeted with enthusiasm. The processes of care have uh, improved significantly there, and, and we believe we're seeing improvements in outcomes as well. We were also able to raise over $35,000, and this came from the San Diego Rotary as well as a lot of individual donors um, via a GoFundMe page, and that was used to purchase equipment for the ventilators and to uh, provide bedside monitoring equipment so that we could care for these patients more safely. Um, we have uh, switched from a daily in-person visits to about two to three times per week teleconferencing visits as well. Mexicali um, is the second largest city in, in Baja, California. And based on our work in Tijuana, we were also invited there. And um, because of the distance, we couldn't spend as much in-person time, but also are doing uh, uh, telemedicine support. These are just some photographs uh, from Tijuana General. Uh, they're unable to do isolation room by room, or at least they weren't at this point. Um, so the, really the whole hospital was sort of a hot zone. And um, we worked very closely with our Mexican colleagues there to try to um, care for these patients as, as, as best as they could. 
This is just us showing delivering equipment. This is bedside monitors um, purchased by the San Diego Rotary down to Tijuana General. And this is just some classroom work in Mexicali talking about nursing interventions around uh, sedation. So currently we've transitioned to um, telemedicine with both sites. We have intermittent in-person activities as well with visits of their physicians to UCSD. Um, we're teaching ultrasound courses at Tijuana General um, so that uh, interventions there can be done more safely, um, working with them around infection control and um, some nursing training as well. So I will stop there. This has been an a incredible uh, number of months here in our division and uh, working both at UCSD and on both sides of the border and uh, certainly something we've learned a great deal from and continue to learn from. Thank you. Mm -hmm.